Welcome to the Evolving World of Work podcast. I'm your host, Dave Clare, and I'm very excited to bring you episode one and a very special guest to kick us off in this new podcast, uh, Dane, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it, is it Groenveld? How yeah, you... Groeneveld, Groeneveld. I don't even say it right according to my <laughs> Dutch relatives. <laughs> so uh, very excited to have Dane on the show. Dane has a passion for exploring human experience and unlocking potential through teams in the world of work. So I couldn't think of a better guest to kick us off. Uh, Dane entered the industry in 2001 and enjoyed co-designing innovative leadership teams and organizational solutions for companies uh, that is navigating. So, but he's founded Huddle Three and also stepping in the role of CEO, I believe, for Leader Three or Leader with a Three in it. So you can explain that why, why the three is in there. Uh, but Dane gained global experience working on executive search assignments and recruitment uh, process outsourcing. Uh, projects was really cool. So he's got like a tremendous amount of background here. Um, and uh, he's also delivered uh, across significantly capital development projects in more than 50 countries, managing over 1300 contingent workers uh, in deployment in the Americas region. So he's got a lot of vast experience in this space. Um, there's so much more. We'll have a lot more of Dane's information in uh, and his bio in the notes of the podcast. And we're not going to spend too much time on that. But I met Dane um, uh, on his podcast, actually, The Future of Teamwork. Uh, so it's really exciting to have Dane here and share his insights to this because he's a guy who's been doing this sort of stuff and talking about this sort of, uh, you know, evolving the world of work and has many guests and tremendous insights to share with us today uh, through that process. So, Dane, man, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Thanks for having me on, Dave. It's great to be uh, guest number one. Yeah, yeah, it's so great. It's uh um, and man, like I just, I, I, I don't, you know, I like to listen to many podcasts and things like that. But yours is one of the ones I've always enjoyed uh, because it does, you know, the future of teamwork and the future of work and the future of leadership and the guests you have are quite amazing. So, the the what not only your own experience that you bring, but what you've gleaned from all those wonderful guests that you've had, uh, even that crazy Canadian guy who lives in Australia <laughs> that you interviewed some time ago. That was a good fun conversation. Yeah, it's uh, and it sparked a lot of really uh, great stuff uh, since then. But Dane, um, yeah. I want to get started. So, can you just share a bit with us about your journey um, and what led you to focus on, you know, the future of teamwork? Yeah, you bet. So, I was lucky to grow up in Australia uh, across a number of mining towns early on. Dad was a mining engineer, uh, eight schools by the time I was fifteen, I think. But we eventually settled down in England, which was a bit of a culture shock um, yeah. at a boarding school that looked like Hogwarts. <laughs> and um, so I finished out school for four years, uh, went to university, fell into the field of recruiting because I did not want to be an engineer like dad and had this great opportunity to take some of my childhood experiences being around mining towns and large facilities and all, all of the community that, that you get in some of those uh, environments yeah. um, into going and working with all a whole bunch of different customers that were trying to grow their businesses and improve their teams. So, you know, 20 plus years in that space and and more recently we've founded the huddle three group as a, a holding company for a number of businesses in that human capital sphere i like to call it a bit of a lab we're yeah. really investigating the future of teamwork now in in a lot of different ways yeah mate, that's awesome and, and thank you for for sharing that what but what what drives your passion for you know this future of you know teamwork where, where, where does that drive come from? Yeah, so I was lucky to be on some great teams, whether it was in the sports field or early career. And when you're on a great team, it just feels awesome. People have your back. Yeah. You're, you feel safe to take risks. Um, you learn quickly. You, you, you build this kind of sense of belonging in the team. And uh, when you're not on a great team, it feels terrible, yeah. um, like absolutely terrible. So I was always fascinated, like, why was it so good on that team? And then why did we fall off being a good team? Or why did I have to move to get my next level of growth? So um, always intrigued by what it means to be on a good team and why we don't have more great teams when we've got so many great people in this world doing so many great things, but just not that many great teams. Yeah, and, and it's funny the um, when you think about the, like in sports and things like that, it's... There's a lot of work that gets done on this. Yet in business, like you know, like the <laughs> and sports is one of the biggest businesses in the world today. Obviously, yeah, but, yeah. It's it's fascinating how we still don't seem to correlate the the sports thing to you know like to just to normal businesses and organizations today. 
I mean, I know how many CEOs and executives, you know, who will go down to the driving range and practice, practice, practice their golf swing yeah. or they go have a round of golf. Um, but they won't get up and practice, practice, practice something before a, a meeting or, you know, like work having a one on one coaching session with their team members or, you know, so it's very fascinating. There's so much we can learn from the sports world, yet we don't seem to parlay it or translate it across. We don't. I think we're overdoing work. I think we've made work not fun and we've made it too busy and we're not doing those practices and and interactive events that you would see more typically in a in a sports field or even in a military environment you know you see a lot of great military teams that get a lot of time to brief debrief train practice yeah you know like uh, one of our guests we'll have coming up william Branham, is ex navy seal uh in conversation with him he he's you know talking about like how much time they spend training for one particular you know mission or whatever they need to do and yeah. the force teams they they practice all week for the three hours on a sunday yeah wouldn't that be nice <laughs> yeah yeah you know um so talk to me about uh what was, was there a pivotal moment or experience that shaped your approach to leadership and work and culture was there anything that really was like it like it really set you down this path i would say um what really forced me down this path was when I was working uh, with a large project in Papua New Guinea. All right. And I was based That's in right. Brisbane. Yeah. We were building a really big LNG facility up there with one of our large customers. And we got to do so much cool stuff, but we got thrown into a really hectic environment, you know, mm. um, visas, immigration, um, relocating people in and out, establishing accommodations, buying a business up there. Um, trying to understand the local uh, frameworks of people and education and everything else. It was just like, wow, this is cool. And I was working across teams of teams, um, not all in one organization. And, and that just totally opened my eyes to what was really good and, and what could be better. And also doing that in PNG. Like, you know me, I like, lived there for 13 months, right? So I, yeah. I understand what it's... <laughs> Yeah, luckily I spent most of my time in Moresby. We had teams right up in the Highlands. You know, yeah. it's a it's a National Geographic postcard, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. So I was based in Lay in the Moraby province and looked after Finchab and Bololo and and Lay and yeah. that. And uh, yeah, so I was up up in that area, and that was like ninety eight, ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Been around then, yeah. So um, yeah, and like so all that other stuff plus that. So so that was the thing that really uh, got you to to look at you know, from a leadership and culture, like that was a pivotal moment for you in terms of, you know, did you yeah. have to, just an interesting question. Did you have to spend time with the national people as well? Yeah. The ex expats that you were bringing in and all that? We we did, uh, the, the language probably isn't appropriate anymore, but we had uh, locals, we had other country nationals and we had expats. Right. So other country nationals were some of the regional talent out of the Philippines, et cetera. Um, and it was great bringing all those teams together. We were doing everything from interns up to, you know, 73 year old process engineers. Um, yeah. So it was a it really, it was a melting pot of talents and cultures. Yeah, I only ask that question because it was, uh, if I reflect on myself, it was a very pivotal moment for me too in my leadership. Um, because, you know, for me, like I think you lead people and you manage resources and people are not a resource. Uh, yeah. So from a leadership point of view, when I first arrived in New Guinea, um, one of the senior executives at the bank, I happened to be doing leadership consulting for a bank at that there. And uh, his word to me is that they, you know, I know why they brought you here, but you can't teach these people anything. You show them something and two weeks later, they'll be Oof. back, but they've always done anyway. And I'm like, yeah, well, if I taught you something once too, you'd be back doing the same thing you were doing before, right? It was when I learned more about human behavior in that 12, 13 months in P&G than I'd learned in my previous 33 years on the planet. Um, yeah. And it was really interesting when you think about, like I said, everyone's born with the same gray matter. Our evolutionary, you know, if you go back the generations, the education that we've had generationally, they, they're just starting at a different time to us. Yeah. And I said, but their brain works the same way as our, same way ours does. And it's like human behavior is human behavior. It does not matter. Um, and then, yeah. you know, if you didn't have any repetition. And if we don't do things with space repetition to condition new way of thinking to derive new results and, and so on, right? The behaviors and the results. So a, after 12, 13 months, we had tr amazing transformation happen in the learning for the people that we had the privilege of serving while we were there. But yeah. it was, there was that pivotal moment for me, like that, you know, the, the, the people 
who created or creating the problem, you know, like the, the, the philosophy or the mindset of the, the leadership team that was there is you can't teach these people anything. So guess what they don't do? Teach them anything. Correct. Because they didn't understand the process. And I thought, okay, this is, and this is where I realized that process for human behavior, this is the magic and science behind everything. And it uh, really is. Yeah. And so that was, it was funny. So my pivotal moment was in the same, same place there, it may not be the same time, but it was definitely from that it was a tremendous learning, uh, you know, like an aha moment for me as a human being and uh, how to help other human beings become their best to do their best while in my care and beyond. Yeah, so it's special. Yeah. So talk to me, let's, uh, let's talk about some uh, insights and perspectives that you could share with the listeners what do you see as the biggest challenge for leaders who are trying to evolve their workplace culture? Yeah, you bet. Um, the biggest challenge is that it's really easy to tick the box. It's really easy to just throw some values on the wall. It's really easy to do a virtual pub quiz, a pizza party, a table tennis table. Yeah. Um, it's really easy to build new ways of working um, around, hey, we're going to have this meeting on this basis. Um, but what's really hard to do is to get into the actual work with team members to create more um, awareness of, of, you know, the unique gifts that each team member brings and the mm -hmm. unique and different perspectives that they have on how we could do the work better. And, and I think the best cultures um, are ones that are dynamic. They're always moving and, and you've got leaders <clears throat> not saying here, this is a HR uh, initiative. You've got leaders saying, we are going to be intentional about how we show up as team members. And, and I think that's a, a big shift towards driving good culture, but it's hard to do because it takes time going back to that sports analogy that we touched on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you didn't say it, but you said it without saying it. Is you talk about like, you know, get into the work with people and then actually start to, you know, talk to the people and, and find out, you know, about them and how they think the work can be done better. Um, absolutely. Yeah, and I think so. This is really important. So, whilst it sounds like you're talking to them, actually, what you're doing is you're listening to them. A lot of listening. Yeah, a lot of listening. And that's what that's what I wrote down here: listening, because that when you said that to yeah. me, it's like, oh, so you're you're actually thinking, catch. we need to actually listen to our people, because a lot of leaders and business owners, uh, like, and what's going to add your insights to this? I find they say, you know, when I chat them about, you know, how they're things, well, I've told them this, and I tell them that, and I tell, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, but when was the last time you actually listened? to them well, I'm you're absolutely right them. i'm always telling yeah. them it, it brings me to one of my favorite <clears throat> pardon me um one of my favorite exercises which is a question storm because you're right talking can be very one directional yes. brainstorming can be very one directional you, you can kind of drive ideas that people know you want to hear but yeah. question storming is very cool because when you get together you listen to what questions should we be asking ourselves? What questions should we be trying to answer for our customers, for ourselves, for our vendors? And, and I think to your point on listening, just turning that lens to, towards curiosity is really critical. Yeah. And, and once again, it's also one of the innate human characteristics that uh, in today's world of uh, automation and AI, that it, AI doesn't have curiosity about it. Mm -mm. Right? It doesn't have a curiosity to it. But we do as humans. No, it doesn't. But the challenge is then, if, if, uh, and once again, further insights, if you can share, if we've spent all this time conditioning our people to not be curious, and now we want to, we, we, we start to be curious in them, is there going to be, our, or our leaders going to experience this thing? Well, people just don't want to answer questions. They just want to be told what to do. Yeah, there's some scary stats out there around like 70% of people won't put their hand up in a room when they're asked because they don't have the psychological safety to contribute. Um, yeah. and that's real. So I think in a workplace where there hasn't been a good level of curiosity, uh, yeah. it, you, you need a spark, you need to, to create a, a moment. And yeah. I think that's done best through stories. So I think yeah. leaders need to be vulnerable. They need to come in and tell a story. Now, whether that's a story about what's happening in the business, a customer, a great team member, a new strategy, um, it doesn't matter, but stories connect humans to um, the emotions of, of a change and how we're going to move forwards. And I think it's a powerful tool that is underutilized. Yeah, and that's a, it's such a great point you raised there because I was actually talking to a friend of mine, Ben. He's, uh, he'll be coming on the podcast um, later in a few episodes time. 
uh, but he's he does brand storytelling, but he does uh, from the inside. I said, most organizations do a great job of telling stories to the outside world, but they do a lousy job telling stories, telling the brand yeah. story from the inside. And so, you know, culture, how we think and feel. So as a leader, if we're not doing what Dane's suggesting here, do more storytelling. And you know, what are the, this is how you start to build those cultural norms in your organizations through storytelling. It's how communities do it. It's how tribes have done yep. it through the years. It's through sitting around the campfire, listening to the elders tell stories and, and you know the things that this is how we build those values or you know like to rather than just having them on the wall right as we've you've alluded to earlier is how to get them into the hearts and minds of the people and that's through storytelling and yep. you know, through customer situations team member situations you name it um and i think that's such an underrated um you know skill if you wish um that leaders don't you know so question storming great then get into telling more stories and helping people connect to those stories. Yep. Yeah. It's I think powerful. Like, yeah. It's so powerful. Um, and so if you're listening, if you do nothing else other than ha have question storming sessions and then storytelling sessions, you can long way to shifting your culture or evolving your culture to the, where you need it to be and getting people more engaged in the work that they're doing in the world. Um, so certainly then, um, Moving through to, I want to talk about topic specific stuff now. One of the things that you're really uh, big on is uh, embracing distributed leadership. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you talk about the effectiveness of distributed leadership in teams and responsibilities and decision making that where it's shared um, and leading to higher performance and more cohesive teamwork. So, can you give us some insight on that? Like, talk to us a bit about this and how does that relate to the evolving world of work? Yeah, I think. The way I look at it, and it's a little bit of a, a personal bias, I like to work in fairly chaotic, small groups. I'm a, I'm a teams guy, I like small yeah. teams, but I don't like hierarchy. Um, it's important for who signs off, who's PTO, or who, who does someone's appraisal. Yeah. I think the concept for me of distributed leadership, which, which is very aligned with your shared leadership concepts, yeah. Dave, is um, let's get small groups of people together who have the skills, willingness, competency, to get stuff done and let's not manage by committee or by hierarchy and let's let those small groups on their various projects, um, you know, drive that, that culture of leadership. Uh, it's, it's particularly powerful because you, it's quite lean. You reduce all of the up and down through functions, which happens yeah. in larger organizations, yeah. but, but also it's an exercise of gratitude because mm -hmm it's normal for a leader to say, well, I'm going to get this done and I'll come back and tell you when it's ready. But if I come and say, Hey Dave, I'd like you to work with me on this project. I know it. I know you touch it every now and again, and I know you're passionate about it. So can you work with me on this project by me inviting you in um, and, and actually maybe going a step further, making it ob an obligation if you're willing to agree to it. Yeah. Um, you're like, Hey, Dane really values my opinion. And he's, he's working with me. Now I can learn how Dane works. Dane can learn how I work. We can achieve something together. And guess what? We can go and tell a story about it later too. So I, I think it's a really good way for organizations to operate. It's also the way that Gen Z want to show up at work. So yeah. if you've got emerging talent coming into your business, this is probably the single best way to operate. Let's be honest, most Gen Z talent coming into the organization has broader perspective and better tool set um, skills than we do. Yeah, yeah. But for some reason, we think because they're young and inexperienced that but they're bringing what the future needs, not what the past required. Correct. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you it's know, 20, it's 21st century thinking for 21st yeah. century results. Yeah. Now, you you slightly younger than me, but you may have been brought up in the same world where um, uh, the, the, the motto was, Dave, you're paid to work, not to think. Yes. Right. 100%. And so and I think I've shared this with you before, but. Now I, we live in a world where I share with leaders the philosophy is, and you know, I, half tongue in cheek but half serious is, you know, hey, Dane, you're paid to think, and while you're here, if you have to do some work, that's okay. Yeah, you know, because we, you know, and so we need curious, creative, imaginative, intuitive thinking in our organization for it to continue to evolve and to not only survive but to thrive into the future. Um, and this is what Gen Zs bring innately because they're at a stage where they have this resilience or resistance to. And we were all born with it. You know, we all like, but why, but why, but why, but why? And then we've been told so because daddy said so for so long in an organizational context that now we wonder why our people won't come up with ideas or they don't feel psychologically safe 
to do that. Gen Z are just yeah. like, basically, screw you. If you don't want, <laughs> you know, uh, and this is why uh, my good friend, Duncan Wardle, he he said, Dave, Gen Z don't want to work for you. Not like me, but for organizations. Nope. He told me, like, they don't want to work for people like you, your organizations. That they, they don't want to work in hierarchies. They don't want to work in these structures. And if this is the future workforce, and, if, you know, even the millennials today don't, and we think that they're lazy. They're not lazy. They just don't want to do the work the way that we used to do it. They want to have a, but, to your point earlier, like, you know, we're overdoing work. They they can see it clearly, right? Yeah. Gen Z can even see it more clearly than than the millennials can. And so, you know, you need to be able to build an organization that these people want to work for, or they'll just go start their own and put you out of business. 100%. And it's exciting because if you bring yeah. the right talent in, if you create a sense of belonging, if you invite them into this distributed leadership model, it actually creates growth and, and upskilling for the rest of your team. You might have some late career team members working on a project with some early career team members. And once upon a time, they wouldn't have even crossed paths in the break room, right? No. And now they're working and learning from each other. And 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 it is symbiotic. There's, there's learning yeah. going in both directions. Yeah, like if you can take the wisdom of the mature age workers that we have in our workforce today, that wisdom, and part that onto the youthful exuberance and understanding of the world, they're you know, uh, I've said this to uh, even with my kids, they're the same. It's like we, we talk about, you know, uh, when things were offline and, you know, versus offline versus online. They go, what's offline? They're born <laughs> into an online world. Like, well, they don't understand what offline is. Everything's online, Dad. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, I and, love it. Yeah. I, I love it. it. Yeah. And, uh, and they're very I, um, immediate too, right? Because yeah. they're used to social media. They're used to getting instant responses. We had a big culture event in Vegas uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And I had a team member walk up and start giving me a little bit of banter about how he'd look better in my jacket than I would. And I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> like that, I would never have done that to my CEO as oh, a 23 no. year old, but now he's coming up and bantering with me and we're building some connection. That's cool. Yeah. Did you give him his jacket and give him your jacket to try on? No. Hell no. Should have said, <laughs> and you should have let him try it on and just gone. Now you're wrong, mate. Put it back on. <laughs> <laughs> no, he would have looked better that, in it than me. So he wasn't going to get that chance. Mate, opinions vary. Opinions vary. It's all right. <laughs> but yeah, like how cool is it where people can do that, where they can feel safe to be able to talk to their CEO of a, you know, your organization isn't a small organization by any means. You're, you know, so like, you know, for back in my days to be able to walk up to the CEO of the organization like that and even just say, hello, Mr. Grun, Grun, Grunfeld. Grun, Grun, Grun. Yeah. I'd be afraid to go, hi, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't want to pronounce your name wrong. I wouldn't want to. Yeah. And, and these days it's, uh, it's different. Now it's interesting though, because I've talked to my dad about this um, and, you know, he's baby boomer and he, he shared, you know, like his perspectives on it. And he says, you know, these kids, they don't want to do this. And I said, but did you want to do that dad when you were that age? He goes, yeah. of course I did. I wanted to go play soccer that. I said, why didn't you? He says, we weren't allowed to. And I said, oh, because you weren't allowed to, this generation shouldn't be allowed to. That's and like, I'm like, real. yeah, like, so you got to like, just because they, they want, we all wanted the same thing. This generation is just willing to do whatever it takes to have it. And so they're far from what I would call lazy or, you know, trying to avoid things. They, but they also want to have meaningful work. They want to be part of something. They want that sense of belonging that you talk about. Like that's critical. So, so yeah. taking all that and considering all the, you know, what you just shared with us there, how do you envision the workplace of the future? You know, say 10 years from now, the, the, 2035 what's the uh, what's the, the the workplace of the future i have a strong belief that it's going to be different in different places but where i want to spend my time where i think my teams are going to do best will be a workplace that looks a little bit more like a college campus um, mm. you've got lots of people uh wandering around in different subjects i would say they're going to be different businesses yeah. and i think you're going to be having people working across multiple businesses in one precinct. Uh, maybe there'll be some shared resources for learning. Maybe there'll be some more entrepreneurship, you know, little businesses working together. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the way of the world. I think you're going to see just this explosion of companies. I think Gen Z are going to be great leaders. They, they like to find ways to break what we currently do and do it better. Yeah. Um, so I think that's going to be part of that story too. And if belonging is important, they're going to want to integrate their life so that their social groups, their health and activities are all in the same place as their work. So that's my hope for the, the future of work. Yeah. I, and that's really cool. Cause uh, for me, I think of commercial communities 
Mm -hmm. Right. So it'd be this community of people doing some commercial business together. Yep. Right? So it'd be like this commercial community that will be happening. Um, and uh, yeah, and people, you know, we're already in the, you know, gig economy, liquid workforce, and, you know, you've been in contingent workforce for many, many decades. Yeah. And, and like, that's just going to be part of the norm of the future. People will, the, the jobs for life won't exist. So organizations, you know, and, you know, my big take on, you know, having ecosystem organizations where collaboration can thrive in an ecosystem, you'll find a lot more organizations working together. And, you know, like, I think there'll be a lot more collaboration happening in, in, in the workplaces um, and that, you know, I love the collegiate look and feel where people will be, you know, it's work will be fun. Yeah, it should be fun. And we should yeah. see more sharing. It's, it's a little yeah. bit disappointing. If you look at over the last 10 years, all of the billions of dollars that we threw into tech platforms that weren't yeah. really solving problems and never became profitable. Yeah. Um, that that's a waste. If you get people doing real work together, um, you don't have to build some future state. You can build on the run, build on the fly, and and actually um, bring a lot more people along in the community. So that that that's exciting for me. Yeah, man, I'm, and and I'm I, I call uh, I'm fascinated for the future, right? So I mean, it's somewhere a little between scary and exciting, right? So I'm fascinated. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, the, the advent of all this AI and automation, new jobs will be created, new models, new organizations, you point, there'll be so many new different businesses created. But, but the cool part of all that is it will all be freeing us up to do the work that humans must do. And Gen Z yes. understand that. So we're like, it's a convergence of all this really great opportunity. And I'm, I think it's just going to be fascinating as we go forward. Speaking of Me that. Too. So what about what's an emerging trend? Like if you think of one emerging trend that you believe will significantly impact the world of work in the coming years, what do you see as an emerging trend? I think fractional work. I think you're going to see, going back to sharing, you're going to see not gig economy, which is a little bit first order. Like yeah. I need a graphic designer. I need a data scientist. I need a virtual assistant. I think you're going to see fractional teams um, and that's going to allow you to, have really good talent sitting in two or three different businesses and you're going to be using them in different ways and it's going to create more connectivity um, and, and more growth and, yeah. and more best practice identification. So I think that's a, that's a theme we're seeing a lot of right now. Okay. So just to explain fractional, just very quickly. What, what so fractional, fractional fractional is if I can work 40 hours in a week rather than working 40 hours for Dave, okay. um, I'm going to work 10 hours for Dave and, 15 hours for Bob and Jenny's going to get the balance of my time. So I'm across three businesses. I have right. three different emails. I'm on three different systems. And yep. and that might seem chaotic to some people, particularly the boomers. Yep. But um, we're actually seeing a lot of boomers embrace it right now towards the end of their career as a way to leverage yeah. their talents and skills. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's people who sit on multiple boards, for example, you know, they, they, that's yeah. fractional work, right? So I'm, I'm a it board member here, here and here. I'm being paid to be on those boards. So they're already doing it. Correct. But I think the fractional work might actually start to cascade down into the earlier career um, yeah. and, and oh, yeah, emerging. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. So those yeah. people at the latter stages of their career, they're, they may not realize they're already doing it. Yeah. Very good point. That's all I'm saying. It's like, so it's kind of like helping people to realize, well, you see what you're doing there? Yeah. Well, that's just that. And they're just doing it now, not here. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, What's one practical tip that you can offer the listeners uh, who want to begin evolving their world of work or their environment today? What's what's one practical thing that you, they could start doing today? Uh, I liked your listening concept earlier. Um, I would say go out and grab a bunch of people. Um, yeah. Don't send them a survey, but grab a bunch of people and get on a visual planning tool. I like Mural, there's Miro, yeah. there's a few others. Yeah. And just start just start going through and asking, hey, what what excites you in this business? What what annoys you in this business? What do you know you have to do that you don't like to do? And, and just start asking wisdom questions. Yeah. Because it it will be informative. And you can go back to them and say, hey, I know you said this, we can't solve that, but I, this really sparked my interest. I'm going to get a team together and we're going to work on that. I think that's yeah. a great starting point. I love that. Um, what do you call them? Wisdom questions? Wisdom questions. Any question that starts with a what. Okay. With a what. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. The, uh, yeah. Cause wisdom is one of our core values at circle leadership, which is learn from experience. 
So, yeah. but that's why I loved it because you, you're learning from their experience as to, you know, what excites them, what, you know, experiential, right? What, what annoys them? Experiential. Yeah. What don't they like doing? Experiential. So these 100%. are really great questions. So if you're listening out there, just start asking those questions. And the key point, I think what Dane raised is to do it in person, not like you can create a survey. Oh, let's just do a survey and get all the information. People are less likely to probably give you meaningful answers in a survey. They'll just give you the motherhood statements. Yeah. Right. So yeah. um, I've got a couple of last questions as we wrap up uh, this podcast. So, so one, what is the common mistake you think that you see organizations or leaders make when they're trying to adapt the future of work? And if, if whatever that mistake might be, how can they avoid it? Uh, I think people try and do too much that's new. Yeah. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So start with the work. Start with the people who are doing the work. Don't start with initiatives. I've fallen foul of that before. Hey, here's our new and latest financial wellness platform so you can learn how to save your money and invest your money yeah. better. Here's our new wellness program. Here's our new this. Here's our new that. That stuff is distracting. It's It's heartfelt. It's meaningful. Yeah. Some people will use it, but... People are busy. We're overworked. So start with the work. Don't we're, don't we're already overdoing work as it is, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah great, great tip for everybody. Um, so as we get to wrap up, uh, last two questions. One is, what's the final piece of advice you would give to your give to the audience here? Whoops, um, about embracing the evolution of work. What's the final tip or piece of advice? Um, outside influence, like. We've, we've talked a lot about going and listening to the team and asking yeah. what questions, but like lift your head up and go out and see what your friends are doing, what's on podcasts, what's on LinkedIn, um, join peer groups. Like outside influence is brilliant because it gives you a safe space to think about how what someone else is doing could play out in your business. And, and yeah. it, it really broadens your mind. Yeah, beautiful. And I know because uh, you, you're you're the epitome of that I see you at different places and I know why you're doing it. You're going out to learn what's happening outside of your world so you can see what's relevant to that. Um, you know, yeah. also, I know, you know, um, one of the things that we, you know, one of our values is insight, which is to anticipate and act in advance is, you know, we're always thinking about our customers, customers, what's happening to our customers, customers world and how will that impact our customers or our clients? And so we can understand that you will never find that out unless you get out. You won't. Yeah. And if you don't have time to get out, go and find someone like Dave who can bring the insights from all of these other businesses and, and <laughs> models because yeah. at least you get to borrow rather cheaply um, yeah. compared to putting all of your time into that journey. Like if you don't have time, find outside influence, bring it into the business. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, so one last thing though too, because one of our things, of course, uh, a part about evolving the world of work that's really critical to us is looking at you as a human being first, a employee second in an organization. So yeah. whilst it's at the end of this, um, here's the human part of Dane. All right. So I have a random list of 31 questions. You need to pick a number between one and 31. And I'll tell you what the question was based on that number. And you have to answer it. And it's all personal um, based questions. So this is just for us to have a little bit more of an insight into you. So Let's what do it. number? Um, Lucky number 19. Number 19. Oh, great. <laughs> I love this question too. This is so cool. So Dane, if uh, an actor was to play you in your life's movie, who would play you and why? Um, that's really easy. I would choose Thomas Hardy uh, because uh -huh. my wife and I have a very clear agreement that um, he is one of the best actors and best looking men around. So I'd, I would like him to be me. Okay. <laughs> and your wife I want said, to be Tom Hardy. Yeah, and your wife said, I'll play my own role. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom Hardy, awesome, yeah. mate. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dane, uh, if people want to find out more about you, the your organizations, um, we'll put your LinkedIn stuff. Is there any specific way people can reach out to you if they want to learn more about you? Where I spend most of my time is on LinkedIn. Um, okay. You'll see me, Dane Grunewald, with a kangaroo in the middle. Okay, um, beautiful. And and the Future of Teamwork podcast is where we're releasing shows every week, including yeah. our show with Dave Clare. Yeah, so I'll, I'll put I'll put all those links into the podcast as we put that out. Um, thank you once again for being guest number one, uh, being the guinea pig for the Evolution of Work uh, podcast. I couldn't think of anyone better to start us off. Um, so, man, thank you so much for that. And uh, man, keep doing the great work that you're doing in the world. And 
you know, together we can evolve the world of work. So appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. No, I love the format. Great show. Thank you.